So I could find time, but last time. Yeah. Last time was on Monday. We on a Monday before the start. I got all the stuff. There are loads of Monday on the start. Friday, Monday. So luckily, unluckily, or unfortunately, or luckily, I don't know. But today, but before I go there, I did not. This was my first day. So I got the time, and I am really thankful to you all for inviting me. They gave me a black topic and interesting Gupta government I don't know, it's only a very insipid topic, a very dull topic, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. First of all, let's delve into how the legal system developed in India. For ancient India, we have to talk right in the case, we have to talk about it. That was the base. That was the base on which the Indian ancient legal system ran. General concept in India, the general belief is manuscripti is written by one sage called Manu. But there is another theory. Manu has written it in the uh, uh, first century. But sages for Balwat, different sages, what they used to do was they used to put down and bend down their ideas of a society. So there is another thing here is that Manuskriti is not the product of a single person, it is the product over, over a period of time which is incorporating different ideas of different stages. Dharmata Manako, medieval period of change that we were under the Mughal school. So Mughal school of like we had uh, Divane Bas and Faustari Gods. Divane, Divane, Gods and Faustari Gods. Divane Gods used to deal with civil cases, and as far as Hindus are concerned, the Hindu law applied for them in those courts. And then we had this Faustari Gods where criminal cases were criminal cases. Muslim law was prevalent then during the Mughal period. Then came the East India Company. They set up the first high court in Calcutta, presidency court, presidency court, followed by Bombay and Madras, which was presidency court. Then they set up a system of court in Muslim court also. But then we had different names. I think it was addressed by different names, like we were called Waki. We are called leaders, attorneys, and we have mustas related to these relevant cases. But one thing was there in the initial period, the Indians were not allowed to practice in the high court. So only the attorneys. The vakils and the attorneys were academically qualified persons to represent cases. Leaders were allowed to keep the cases or represent clients on the basis of their experience and skill, and they were given sanads. Sanad is prevalent even in Samaraja. Sanad is a foundation to represent a case. Stars, avenue agents, and workers were given, not working, leaders were given sanads to represent that to take the foundation of the concept of the case. But do you know what he can do? One of the Garbanga Jepsunedi, upper British period, though, they used to call what these leaders and these Muktas uh, as scouts, scouts, and they to be blunt brokers. By annoying the friend, they put away a whatever type, what we call ambulance cases now in life. So, over a period that went on, and then we had many acts. So you, earlier as you don't need a common creature of advocate, as far as bar councils are, the like, judicial acts are done, Indian bar councils act 1926, then finally the advocates act 1961. So the advocates act evolved through these earlier acts. 
and once the aggregate lag came into force, all other nomenclatures were given a go by, and all legal practitioners were to be addressed only as aggregates. There was no differentiation under the barrister, wakil, or feeder, or whatever. So everybody who was professionally entitled to practice could be addressed only as advocates. So that Advocates Act 1961 came into force. And uh, this was based on the recommendations of the All India Bar Committee made in 1953, taking into consideration the recommendations of the then Law Commission. The Advocates Act was enacted. So basic intent or the purpose of the Advocates Act was to provide for security, safety and some norms or guidelines to maintain the dignity of such a noble profession. Noble profession and some people might differ nowadays, but as far as we know, we are the upholders of the constitution, we are the last resort for justice, for the common man. So, it is a noble profession. A noble profession requires that the participants or the practitioners of that noble profession should behave with dignity, upholding the dignity of the profession. So, there are some guidelines given in Chapter 2 of the Bar Council of India rules of how an advocate should act or what an advocate should do or what an advocate should not do. And the breach of these guidelines will amount to breach of court of conduct and are liable to be or right by the bar council on a concrete given for and they are liable for punishment. So let's first go through some of the main things which are recommended. There are about 32 to 36 recommendations of how an advocate should behave or how an advocate, what are the ethics your advocate should follow in his practice. These are some of the main important things I will read to you. The first and the foremost important is to first the profession. An advocate is supposed to represent a case without fear or favor and maintaining the dignity and maintaining the dignity of the court. But maintaining the dignity of the court then it reads or it is put down specifically that you don't have to be subservient to the court. You maintain the dignity of the court, but you don't have to be subservient to the court and you should have the gumption or you should have the gut to question the court, complain against the court, when the court is not functioning properly or functioning in a very bad way. You should have the, uh, like the guts or the strength to complain against the court in such a situation. And again it says at the same time advocates shall always maintain a respectful attitude towards the court. That is because the courts are looked up to and the dignity of the court reflects on the advocates. Unnecessarily if you put in the court, you the court in every So the maintenance of the dignity of the court reflects on the dignity of the advocate. So it is an important responsibility on us that we have to maintain the dignity of the courts. And uh, this everybody, everything is based on morals. All the guidelines mostly are based on morals. Like you are not supposed to influence the decision of the court in any way, whether it is by making a false representation or any other way. And you should not communicate privately with the judge. That's an important aspect. You should not communicate privately with the officers of the court. That is, if you do so, that again is the breach of court. And that has a responsibility towards the behavior and the act of the Not only that, you should respect the Something illegal like trying to influence a witness, trying to influence a witness, or he has the responsibility to stop that on the fine does not stop doing so in spite of the advocate or spite of his spent for his
and the adverb is that actionable for the your for your function. You cannot ask for it. You can only ask the ask. You cannot ask the why you did it back. Ask for it. Yeah. You didn't ask. And any advocate can represent that a case starting with the property and it comes up for option in the court, he, he cannot participate in the He is like if it is some other advocate who has built the case and the court is optional, that if we are no way concerned with the case, we can always participate in the option. But once we are involved in the case, particular case of which the property is involved, we are not supposed to participate in the house. And an advocate should keep an account of all the money in respect to him by his mind towards expenses and he has to maintain an account of the expenses in bed and the amount divided towards his fees. He has to tell the client what his fees is. And to sum it all up in a simpler way, any advocate is supposed to like he should not resort to professional negligence, contempt of court, and improper behavior before the court, giving improper advice to the client, not speaking the truth, making attempts to or suggesting to influence the court officials, and the section of bar council of India, section one of bar council of rules of India. Option 1 to 32 describing all these acts, which the advocate is supposed to maintain, which he has to adhere to, to maintain the decorum and the dignity of our profession, are all enumerated. Then coming to section 35 of the Advocates Act, it is regarding section 35 of the words, it is regarding the complaint against any breach of conduct by an advocate. Whom it should be made to. Any complaint by any breach regarding any breach of conduct by an advocate as enumerated in the rules. If there is a breach of conduct, a complaint should be made under 35 1 either to the secretary or the bar council chairman. So once the, once the complaint is made to the secretary or the bar council chairman, the bar council decides whether there is any prima facie evidence or prima facie case which needs to be probed further, then it will be referred to the disciplinary committee. The disciplinary committee, if it finds fault with the advocate, it can recommend for the following actions. Reprimanded, temporary suspension of, of him from his practice, or suspend him forever or debar him from practice or remove his roles from the list of advocates in the bar court. And, and then, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell one important thing. When you are giving a notice, the disciplinary committee gives a notice to the uh, respondent, the advocate, it has to give the notice to the respondent and to the advocate then. The advocate general can himself present himself for the hearings or he can depute somebody for the hearings. And suppose the chairman is not there at the hearings or the president of the disciplinary committee is not there. The decision of the disciplinary committee will be valid. It cannot be challenged on the ground that the chairman is not there or the disciplinary it is not there. As far as it's the majority decision of the disciplinary committee, nobody can challenge it on that. And then comes the appeal. The state bar council, how and another aspect is when a state bar council receives a complaint, it can on its own withdraw and refer it to bar council of India if the matter requires to. Or else, if it does not dispose for one year. Term, after receiving a complaint or anything, the state bar council, the complaint automatically will be strictly forwarded to the bar council of India. And what authority or what is the procedure to be followed by the bar council of the state 
or the Bar Council of India while trying such cases. They can send a civil procedure code. They can summon witnesses. They can summon documents. They can. All the matters have to be disposed within six months or one year. Appeal to Bar Council of India. And the Bar Council of India, while disposing, if it alters the order in any way, it has to implement the state bar council before making any change in the orders given by the state bar. And section 38 provides for appeal against the orders of the disciplinary committee of bar council of India to the Supreme Court. Any person aggrieved by the orders of the disciplinary committee of bar council of India can appeal, appeal to the Supreme Court within 60 days from the date on which the order is communicated to him. And regarding the powers under Section 42 of the Act, the disciplinary committee of the Bar Council are provided with the same powers as respect to the civil courts under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908, which enable them to summon and force attendance, to examine any person on board. Call for discovery or production of any document, requisition any public record or copies from any court or office, receive evidence on affidavit, issue commissions for examination of witnesses or documents. And the state bar council or the bar council can also require or requisition the attendance of any judicial But that can be done only with the express permission of the bank. Judicial officers can also be summoned. Revenue officers can also be summoned with the permission of the state law. So these are the powers which they are interested with for inquiring into any complaint of breach of conduct by China. And there is always this. Uh, it has been going on, and we come across cases advocates practicing illegally without proper qualification. As the bar council on receipt of a complaint of such person practicing without illegally without being qualified or as an advocate, the bar council on finding him guilty can punish him of, in, with imprisonment of the money. So, this is the gist. I could not elaborate on this more than any uh, more than this because. This is all it is, and it is all morals and ethics, and it is in our good step that we follow it. And if we come across anybody who is practicing illegally or who is resorting to any breach of conduct, to maintain our dignity, to maintain the sanctity of our profession, I request all the advocates to make it more to the bar for so that we can take appropriate action, or so that others also will be deterred from not resorting to such illegal practice. I thank you once again for the opportunity given to me. I hope I have made myself clear. Thank you. Any question on the Any question?
To which we are not sure, but as far as I know, no obligation is not necessary as long as the advocate has been paid his fee. And uh, when the services are not good, the client is liberty to appoint another advocate. That's right. I clarify it tomorrow. You will do what that anyway, anyway. Because you cannot hold the client to answer. And I have read it somewhere. I will uh, go through it and get back to you on what that <laughs> we have to challenge it because we cannot let a client if we had a to answer and another thing is a client cannot take our services and then jump and uh, go to another advocate. There are two things involved. Let me clarify and I will get back to you on what's up. Like my friend here told Kamnataka High Court judgment to the objection is not necessary, but recently our high court is objection is mandating.
and they are able to pay 10 lakhs death benefit. What I have suggested is being discussed today, but if there is, if you all concur with it, if there is a resolution, and I had told the bar council also, I had suggested, suppose we pass this amendment, immediately, whatever the collections we get or we don't get, immediately increase the death benefit to 6 lakhs. After one year, we can see what we can increase. So, I request the bar association to please send a request, a resolution to the bar council, Stressing for this because it is it was with also and passing Thank you. 